We're getting a, a late start this morning, but we've been visiting. <clears throat> Let everyone get settled here. Our pastor, Brother Smith, of course, you know he's on the way to the campground along with, uh, we have several people out, but the Lord saw fit to send us some good help with uh, Brother and Sister McClanahan and Sister Amanda from Houston. Aren't we glad they came all the way here? Let's give them a hand. We're really thankful for the Houston church. I've Part of my testimony uh, involves the Houston church, and years ago, our first general meeting uh, was at the Houston church, when it was still on Airline Drive a long time ago, <clears throat> and Brother Clyde Patton was still the pastor, and we, uh, at that time, we only had four children. We, Brother McClanahan, you have six children, I believe, and you beat me, we had five. But when, when we first went to Houston, we only had four, and I think one of them were st was still in diapers. So it's been a while back, and we were, we were trying to, we were new to this, and we were trying to figure out where we were and how, what was going on, and, and that was the first time I ever saw Brother Leninger get up and talk, and he impressed me so much. Uh, everyone at that general meeting, uh, Brother Clyde Patton, a, a, a lot of the, a lot of the main brethren got up, and I had never seen men handle the Word of God or the Spirit of God uh, like they did in that uh, general service. And, and I remember um, there was a new brother with me, and we listened to Brother Ray Leninger talk on uh, out of the book of Revelations about uh, the four horses, and I was writing notes. I wasn't getting it all, but I was getting bits and pieces. We'd only been in the body about six months, and the brother next to me, he was reading out of the book of John, and I said, aren't you listening to this? He says, I'm not getting anything out of this, you know, but I was making notes, and that's when I found I no longer make notes in my Bible, because I made notes in the sixth chapter of the book of Revelations, and I, after that, I started making notes in pencil because I had to start erasing everything. Everything was so new to me, but, but uh, uh, my wife and I, we sat down to eat. We were one of the, the last to sit down and eat, and my wife and she got up with, uh, with the four children to take care of them, and, and then uh, Brother Brown, Brother Billy Brown, sat right next to me, and I'm kind of quiet, and he's kind of quiet, too, and we both sat there. There was hardly anybody else in the dining room. And he put down his, he, he knew I was new. Uh, you, you, can, you can just kind of tell. And I was real quiet. And I'd already been amazed and, uh, about the people there. In, in fact, uh, after Brother, Brother Ray Leninger talked, uh, it was the, the end of the day, and we were getting ready to go to the dining room uh, uh, for the, the dinner. And I happened to be standing down front, and Brother Leninger came up to me, and he looked right at me, and he, I felt something I'd never felt before. Uh, I'd been in uh, a nominal church for years. I'd got the Holy Ghost out in religion, but I saw that these men had something that I was lacking, and the organization that I was in was also lacking. So he came up, and he stuck his head out, and I'll never forget these words. The first thing Ray Leninger ever said to me was, hello, young man. <laughs> That's just how he was. He said, hello, young man. And I don't think I even shook his hand. I, I was intimidated by him, and I was a little fearful, too. I just stood there. I went, hop, 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 and he just kind of looked at me for a few minutes. And he, he's probably thinking, this poor guy. <laughs> and he turned around and walked away. And then, and then that same day, uh, Brother Brown was sitting right across from me. He must have had something to do because he was eating a very late dinner like I was. And we sat there quiet for a few minutes. And he finally looked up at me in, in that voice of his. And he says, brother, what do you think about dinosaur bones? And I just fell in love with him. And ever since then, whenever I see him, he always, he always asks me a question. I'll say, brother Brown, you know the answer to that. I don't. And last time, uh, last year, we my wife and I were not going to be able to attend the uh, campground this year. I have a hospital. Uh, my sister 
in uh, Missouri is in the hospital, so we've been trying to monitor her situation, whether we need to go or not. But last year we went, I saw Brother Brown, and he came up to me, and I started talking to him, and he asked me, he said, did you ever figure out about dinosaur bones? And I said, no. I, he said, I said, did you? And he said, no. But um, I've always had a special place in my heart for the Houston church and, and the people in Houston, so I'm really glad for Brother and Sister Matt McClanahan. And it's good to see uh, Sister Bonnie. We've really prayed a lot for you and your whole family. We want you, we hope you feel the, the prayers and the care and the concern of all of us. And, and we want you to know that we have your back on all this. So, <clears throat> so I'm thankful to be here today. And we are getting a, 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 a um, we're not starting on time. Um, but when I first came to the body, there were so many things that was needful for my family and I to know and to learn and to experience. And after all these years, we're still going through that uh, phase that there are so many things that we need to know and learn and experience to be successful in God. And, and that's my desire, is to be successful in God, uh, to be pleasing to Him, to uh, have the right fellowship with His people, and... Uh, to have a vision, to increase in vision, and to walk in the uprightness of heart. But when I first came in, I, even though I had the Holy Ghost, and my wife and I, we had been brought up in Pentecostal churches, we had always been not so much taught, but it was an unspoken rule that if you were a pastor or a minister, in the nominal churches out there, they had a saying, you're meddling, preacher, you know, you're meddling from the platform, don't do it. My wife and I, um, and the only time I had received counsel or counsel together with my wife and I is we had two days of counseling when we got married, and that was for one hour uh, uh, each session, and that was required to get married in the church that we were going to get married in which is really a good thing. I, I don't think two days is enough. Uh, I think a young young couple that's looking to be married, I know Brother Smith, he always does that for young people that are going to get married. He has quite or several counseling sessions with them to make sure everyone's on the same page. And it's good to get things ironed out a lot of times. But the only time my wife and I, we ever went to counseling uh, was when we got married, and that's been a long time ago. But other than that, when we had a problem, we never sought uh, counsel from uh, the pastor of the church or a minister there, whether it was financial or whether it was physical or a problem with a family member or at work, anything, you know. Uh, we, we just, uh, in fact, uh, my three sisters, I have, I have three sisters, and all of them go to that same denomination, and one of them was having an issue, and it was a pretty severe issue, and I said, well, have you talked to your pastor about that? And she went, huh? You know, this was on the phone, and so we talked for a long time, and I told her my thoughts on getting counsel, and uh, she said, you know, I never thought of that. And to me, it's amazing that we have a, a tool uh, that uh, we can veil our, avail, ourself, our veil, uh, avail ourselves of that uh, the, rest of, the rest of the religious world doesn't use. And, and there's a scripture, there's a scripture kind of along this line. If you would turn over to uh, St. John chapter 10, one thing I had to learn uh, when I first came to the body was there's different there's many voices in the world the bible even talks about different voices and to know the voice of god and just what what your wants and what your desires are but in um in saint john chapter 10 let's see we can start i'm not going to read the whole chapter because we'll run out of time in the 26th verse, Jesus said, But you believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, 
and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. We're still learning to know uh, the voice of our shepherd. We're in the, we have the Holy Ghost, we're, we're in the body of Christ, we have a vision, we are counted as one of his sheep, but it's a continual growing process to, to know the voice of God and, and the voice of our shepherd and to be able, is this ringing? Or is it just, okay. Uh, and to know the voice of God and to be able to separate that from the other voices in this world and when I first came in, I was trying to figure that out. We, uh, like I said, my wife and I, we, we went to a denominal church, a large church, and they, you don't counsel, you don't get advice. And when I first came in, after I'd been in the body for about a year, and I saw that things don't operate exactly here the way it did from where I came, so I started praying about that. I said, Lord, is it right to give a man? Because out there they don't allow a pastor to interfere in other people's lives other than what you might get over the pulpit or what you might read in the Bible or what you might see on TV or something. But he didn't interfere. If, if something hit you and helped you, it was just by accident. They were throwing things out. But as far as individual counsel, that wasn't, that wasn't ever done out there. To us it seems strange. My children have all grown up in the body and they're used to that. They, uh, they've seen me go to Brother Smith for counsel. They've seen, they, they've seen counsel work. But out there it was a different language to everyone. So I started seeing people in our church how God was helping them through counsel. And uh, I thought wow, if I want to submit my life not only to a man but to a ministry and I didn't know about, you know, my sheep know my voice and none other will they follow. I really didn't know much about that. But I knew and I saw that people were getting blessed because they were getting counsel. And I started praying about that. And uh, the Lord, the Lord, the uh, Lord, I am, I've only used a fleece a couple times, and that's one thing we're going to talk about. How do you know uh, the voice of our shepherd? How do you know the voice of God? How can you differentiate that between what you want or what the world wants or what your spouse wants or what your, how do you know those things? I didn't know any of those things back there. So um, we're gonna talk for a few minutes on how to know the, the voice of the Lord and how, can, how you can receive from him. And the best way to do it is to start in the Old Testament. Some of these, uh, a lot of them about Gideon, I, we know the story, I'm not going to read all three chapters about Gideon, it would take too long. But I can see that there's, in the Old Testament, the way that the people and the king would receive instructions and commandments from God would be number one through uh, a fleece, that would be number one, which is rarely used. I think there is a place for fleeces, but if you study it out in the Bible, it, it was rarely used, and normally it was for a, a life-changing uh, an event. And I think you have to be, uh, Gideon, you know the story, uh, uh, the angel appeared and, and uh, he, uh, Gideon became a, a judge for so many years over Israel. And, and God was uh, asking him through that angel to go up and, and fight against that army. Um, and of course, you know the story. Uh, Gideon said, Lord, if this is really you, then uh, I'm going to put this sheep's fleece out. And that's where we would get the term fleece. And you probably knew that, but if you don't, you can go back to Judges 6, and 6, 7, and 8. And that's where that is used about the fleece of Gideon. He said, I'm going to lay this on the ground, and, and if it's really you talking to me, and I appreciate that, that he just, he, he was already accounted a mighty man of valor, and the an angel had already appeared to him, but it wasn't enough that the angel appeared on to him. The Bible says, out of the mouth of two or three, let that thing be established. 
So Gideon was using the asking of a sign from God. That may be a better word than a fleece, but uh, Gideon put that uh, sheep's fleece out on dry ground. He said, Lord, if this was really you and you want me to do this, because the Lord was asking him to go up to a, a multitude that greatly outnumbered him of hardened, fighting, fighting men. And if it wasn't God, then Gideon wouldn't lose his life and, and all the Israelites that had joined him would, would lose their lives too. Gideon wanted to make sure, I want to make sure this is you. This was a big deal. I think this is one place where you can use a fleece, but you have to be careful because I'll show you why. Gideon made it so that he didn't say, Lord, if, if my so-and-so comes up to me and says, hi, today, I'm going to know that that's you. You know, Gideon made it so that it would almost a super, supernatural occurrence that there would be no way to doubt that it was God. He laid that fleece out and he said, if in the morning the fleece is wet with dew and the ground is around about it is dry, then I'll know it's you. Well, he got up the next morning and 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 that's what the Lord had done. The fleece was wringing wet with dew, but the rest of the ground around it was dry. And he still had questions in his mind. And he said, Lord, I know you're dealing with me. I'm talking days vernacular. <clears throat> he said, but I'm going to put this fleece out again on the ground. And tonight, if the fleece is dry, but all around it is wet with dew, then I'll know that it's you. And the Lord did answer that fleece. When I first came into the body, I started, I heard this story. I'd heard it before, but I felt like maybe God maybe had called me to the ministry to do something maybe a little different. So this one brother, I told him uh, I was going to go to the uh, Ontario, uh, California meeting. We were going to drive all the way from Midland, Texas to Ontario uh, without stopping. We didn't. So there was a caravan or four or five cars. And back then in our younger days, uh, we would only stop to, to use the restroom or get something to eat. And if you were tired, uh, I wouldn't certainly do it now, but you've probably all been there. Uh, someone in the back seat would reach over the driver and they'd take the wheel and, and we, would, we would switch drivers. We'd scoot over. You'd have to take your foot off the gas and we would never stop. And, the Lord just covered us, and, and we got there, and I, I told this one brother, I said, look, I said, I feel like maybe God's dealing with me, so I'm going to lay out a fleece, and he thought, well, um, what would your fleece be? I said, my fleece is, and I'd never been to Ontario, I, 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 I didn't know anyone there, I said, uh, my fleece is that if Brother Mears will get off the platform the first meeting and come down and invite me to sit on the platform, I'll consider that being called ministry. And, and this brother said, oh, brother, he said, don't do that. Don't do that. And he started into the, uh, uh, you know, with uh, showing me how that God can put it in the heart uh, of, of the 10 kings to give their power to the beast for one hour. And, and God can put it in the hearts and minds of people to do this. But when you're dealing with uh, a human that has free will, uh, and we haven't reached that place yet where we can totally know if it's God dealing with us or not. And that's why it, it's better to get witness of two or three. He said, you better not do that because chances are that probably won't happen. I said, you think so? And he said, yeah. There, there's, there's times where I believe we can use a fleece, but I think it has to be reasonable with God, and I, I think it has to be on a very limited basis. Uh, so I, I think um, I did put out a fleece one time when I first started uh, hearing in the body in our local church about the counsel of God and submitting our life and, and uh, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and uh, that he may exalt you in due season. That hand of God, of course, is his ministry. I started hearing all those things, and I, I really prayed. I, I wanted to know... Uh, see, now I'm relating something in the Old Testament to something we can do today to hear the voice of God. Uh, I started praying, and I felt like I, I needed to put a fleece out. And I said, Lord, if this is really you dealing with me that I should submit my life to a ministry, 
and a pastor and in a ministry in general, the, the leading brotherhood, but specifically the ministry of a local assembly, then I'm going to, I'm going to open this Bible and I'm not going to thumb through it. I'm going to open it up and let the pages fall wherever they may fall. And, and I'm going to look. And the first verse I see, if you really want me to submit my life and do this, I've got to know because this, this was all new to me. So I did. I opened it up and it fell to the book of Revelations. Uh, or, excuse me, the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter the 25th verse and just the first half of the 25th verse of Hebrews 12 is almost like it jumped out of the page at me and it said see that you refuse not him that speaketh I thought wow that really works I mean that real so I took it I closed I closed that and I, I've never questioned that again I felt like that was from God I knew that was from God that was a direct answer from God. He knew I was, I was, I was new. I, I feel like today we get the majority of our instructions and guidance from God through God's ministry. And we'll get onto that in a little bit too. But back then, I wasn't brought up in this. My wife wasn't either. And we needed an anchor to know that this is where God wanted us to be. So I took that as an anchor and it's held me all these years. And uh, when a man of God tells me to do something, specifically the pastor, because that's who I sit under, it, it's, I don't, he sits under, you know, the, the brotherhood, uh, uh, the ministry of Christ, but I sit under him, so I get my direction from him. But I took that from God that I was uh, not to refuse what he said. I haven't done it yet. That's been an anchor after all these years. That's part of my testimony. So I believe if you want to hear the voice of God, you can, you, uh, in certain uh, instances, you can use a fleece. Um, I tried it one other time, and after that, I quit putting out fleeces. Uh, it didn't work anymore. I said, I'm going to open this Bible, and if it's you, then it, it, it didn't work again. It was always be some something that didn't fit or was strange. It just worked that one time for God to show me. I have put out some fleeces uh, and we had uh, someone in my family what was was going to purchase a house and um, they called brother smith and they were ready to make this offer on the house and brother smith said well i think you ought to he, he thought about it. he said i think you ought to i think you ought to offer this and we all thought there's no way. I mean, that is so far below what the asking price is. In a hot housing market, there's no way. Because people were not only buying, uh, paying asking price for houses, but no contingencies. And, and uh, a lot of people were buying the houses for more. And this was way, way under market value. And, and this person said, well, I'll go ahead and do it. And to me, that was kind of like a... And Brother Smith said, if they take it, then you'll know it's, it's, it's God. If not, then, you know, move on. And the people took it. They took it for that offer. And that is a type of a fleece. Now, that's kind of a combination of a council and a fleece. I believe in fleeces like that. I've done that when we purchase property. If, 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 we can, if, if you can see this, then we'll know it's you or something like that. Um, so I think they can be useful, but I do think that you, they should be limited and, and uh, you have to be careful with them. So it does work. And then, then the other way that uh, the people of God, including the kings of Israel and Judah, and the people in general, um, they had uh, uh, prophets. Isaiah, uh, David uh, had a prophet and his name was Nathan, uh, along with other prophets that would, would uh, counsel, counsel uh, the kings of Israel and let them know what the will of God was. Of course, you can read about uh, uh, Ezekiel, uh, 
uh, Jeremiah, uh, all these men, and how God sent them not only to the people in mass, but to leaders of the people specifically to give that nation, whether it's Israel or Judah, direction or even correction. And in by them going to the leaders, uh, the kings, uh, and the priests of, of that nation, it would filter down uh, through the leadership of that nation down to the whole people. So God would send prophets, uh, both written and spoken, to God's people to deal with the king who would then set the course and the direction for the whole nation. And being an obedient nation as they were, they would, they would follow after the king. And that was, that was very effective way back then. Uh, and I still believe that in type, that that's how God shows us his will for our life and the direction of the body is through his ministry. And a lot of times God deals with uh, a man of God first or the ministry of the body of Christ and then they'll take it to the threshing floor if it's something new or if, or if there's a change. A long uh, five or six years ago, Brother Gary Green had a, a dream. I think it was five or six years ago. And um, he was amongst a large group of people, a crowd, a huge, huge crowd. And they were all going in one direction. And every once in a while, someone would jump up as high as they could to try and see what was up ahead. And uh, sometimes they would put their, the person behind them would put their hands on, uh, uh, on the person's shoulder in front of them and they would push off and try and jump up as high as they could to see where this great crowd of, of people were going. And someone did that and they said, hey, I think we're making a turn, you know. Well, God can do that with, with his people. God can deal with his people we, we are a great multitude uh, the body of Christ we're, we're growing and we're gaining and in, in people and knowledge and understanding but it takes someone that's able to get a little bit higher to see if we are making a move if the direction that we're going is the right way and that uses God uses his prophets uh, back in the Old Testament today, he uses his uh, ministry, uh, anointed men of God who were able to, uh, I'm retired now, but I was a supervisor. Uh, I was a, uh, I guess you'd call me a plumbing supervisor, but I was over a lot more. I was a, a master plumber. I worked for a big school district, but I was over special projects and other things, and I was really busy. And I got so busy with the projects that were given to me. Uh, my boss, who was a chief operations officer, he told me, he said, Roy, he said, sometimes you just have to get out of the, uh, the foxhole and look around and see what's going on. He said, that's my job. He said, I set that direction. It's your job to make that direction happen. So uh, I found that to be the case. I would be so busy. Uh, in, in, in certain things that I couldn't, I would lose sight of the big picture. And sometimes that, that's his, how it is in a, a home, home assembly, your, your home assembly. We, we get so busy in dealing with problems here or dealings with problems with that or trying to increase attendance or maintenance of the building that every once in a while, thank God that there are men who are able to rise up and, and look around and, and see if we are going in a different direction. I appreciate that dream that Brother Gary Green had. I think it's an encouragement for us all that God will use men in this body to, just like the prophets of old, to, uh, to uh, help establish us, give us what we need. So, so just like it was in the old days, God would use prophets dealing with the kings and the priest to set the direction. So God uses his, his anointed ministry today to keep us on the right track, going in the right direction. And I appreciate that. That's part of knowing the voice of God. Number one, you know, if, if you're new, you may not know uh, what the voice of God is. It takes years, and I'm still learning the difference between God's voice and my voice. And I'll give you a little bit more testimony along that later. And another way is the Urim and the Thummim. In the, in the Old Testament, the priests, and there's 
different views of what the Urim and Thummim were. Most people believe, and I think this is pretty much the consensus in the body, is that the Urim and the Thummim were uh, placed on the shoulders of the priesthood. And when, and when uh, the king, David, used the Urim and Thummim, a, a, uh, um, who was the king before? Saul. King Saul tried to use the Urim and Thummim, but uh, he wasn't allowed to do that. But they would get their direction. And it's my understanding of, and there's a, not a lot on the Urim and the Thummim. Most people believe that it was a yes or no type of a question that uh, the king would ask the priest who was wearing the Urim and Thummim. Uh, and if, if the stone would glow on one side, it would be a yes. And if it was a, a no, the other side would glow. I tend to believe that's, that what, that's what it was. That was used a lot to determine the leader's uh, idea of what God's will is for this. There was one time when uh, Benjamin sinned and uh, uh, th this, this was before even King Saul. Uh, Benjamin sinned and did terrible things and the rest of Israel went up against him and they wanted to know who was going to go up first. And through the, the, the Urim and the Thummim, they just determined it would be this one tribe. And they thought, okay, so they went up and they lost that day. And of course, the next day they used the Urim and Thummim again. But the Urim and the Thummim were used to lead God's people, but not everyone had access to the Urim and the Thummim. I think that's another, uh, another thing we could use today. The average person wouldn't go up to the priest and would say, you know, uh, does the Lord want me to plant wheat this year? Or do he want me to plant barley? You know, that's not what the Urim and Thummim was for. It was for uh, God to help the leader of that nation direct the rest of people in the paths and the ways that they would go. We still see that today, the same, the same thing that Gary, uh, uh, Gary Green saw on his dream. You know, someone able to get up a little bit higher and see that we are making a turn. So... That's one way that we can know uh, the voice of God today. That's another way is through, is through his, his ministry. And then of course, dreams and visions. Uh, I've had some dreams. I've never had a vision. I would love to have a vision, but God can deal with us through dreams and visions. But then again, I think it should be established. This should be any time that God's making uh, us or allowing us to make a major, or asking us to make a major change uh, in our life, um, I think we should get counsel from our pastor. You know, I think that should be the, the first course of action. When my wife and I, when we first came to the body, we didn't, we knew nothing about order. We knew nothing about serving God, even though we'd been raised in Pentecost. We didn't, we weren't brought in this, so we had to learn a lot of things. We we were constantly going to counsel. I remember one time I went to Brother Smith and it must have been 11.30 or 12 o'clock at night, uh, real late. And he was, he was talking to me and my wife was talking to his wife. And, I got, and we were standing in the driveway getting ready to go. And I, got to, I got real close to him so that nobody would hear us. I almost whispered in his ear and I said, Brother Smith, I said, how many people know this? And he looked around. You'd have to get to know Brother Smith really well, but that's how he, he looked around. And he says, brother, he says, everybody does. I said, everybody? He said, everybody knows this. But I was still learning. I was still learning what the voice of God was for me. And I was learning to follow that voice. Like it says, my sheep uh, know my voice. And they're going to follow me. And through that, they're going to have everlasting life. So I'm still learning, I'm still learning that today. My wife and I, we've come a long way. We finally got to where we use all methods of hearing God's voice. And you should grow to the place where you can start to discern between your voice. I'm not talking about this, this is my voice, but you have a voice on the inside, okay? That's your desires, that's your wants, that's what you think ought to be done. And sometimes none of those things are what God wants in our life. And we have to learn to not listen to that voice and, and hear what God is speaking to us through these ways. That, oh, also, let's don't forget the Word of God. 
uh, I've got direction from, from God before, uh, from his word. I love these scriptures. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more unto the perfect day. But the wicked are not so, for they walk in darkness and know not what they stumble. The word of God, the anointed word of God, along with all these other ways of hearing uh, the voice of our shepherd, the word of God is a very strong and powerful thing. I think a lot of us here are on the program of reading your Bible through every year. My wife and I, we've never done it chronologically, so we're well over halfway through, but we're reading it through chronologically, and that's really helped us, the both of us. And we're going to run out of time, but we should grow to a place that we can hear the voice of God. Uh, and I'll give you one little testimony, and then we'll have to get ready for band practice. Of course, you all know, um, almost nine years ago, I almost died with a cerebral hemorrhage, a, a brain aneurysm. Fairly common, and about 50% of the people that have a, uh, uh, an aneurysm that ruptures usually die. Well, I was mine ruptured, and I passed out, and it was a t I went through a terrible experience. I was in the hospital for almost died, uh, hospital for seven days. I came home one day, and uh, uh, the next day I had a stroke. I, I, I went to church. I came home Saturday, went to su church Sunday, and then Monday I had a stroke, and that, that's 30% of the people that have a cerebral aneurysm rupture uh, usually have a stroke. It's, it's where your uh, arteries in your brain, they spasm, and it's, it's not a... It's not a normal stroke, but it was a, a stroke never, nevertheless. So I turned around and I went back into the hospital. It was another seven or eight days and almost died again there. So um, they had two on one side and those were repaired, but I still had one on this side. And uh, the doctor, I had already scheduled an appointment with the doctor to have this one fixed because I went through such a horrible experience uh, uh, in, those, in, in recovery period. Uh, so, uh, already, I'd already gone in for pre-op uh, 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 analysis and everything, and about a week before I was scheduled to go in for the surgery, I told, I told Brother Smith, I talked to him, I said, Brother Smith, I said, I never had a chance to put trust in God on the aneurysm because I didn't know I had one until, bang, one ruptured. I said, I know I have one now. I said, I feel like... Uh, I, I, I need to trust God and see if he won't touch me for this. And, and he stood with me on that, so I canceled the surgery. Uh, but then I had to start going in. At first, I think it was every three months and then every six months for what they call a CTA, a computed tomography angiogram of your brain. And it was just a small, the smallest, smallest, smallest little aneurysm. The doctor, who was one of the best in the world, I was fortunate to have him, Dr. Ali Krisht, love that man. I always tell him, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. Uh, but he put a name on it. He called it Little Nubbin, because it was so small. I, I said, of course, I told him what I was doing. He was a Christian man. I told him I was trying to trust God uh, and have some faith on that. He said, I understand that. And I said, but let me ask you a question. We're, by this time, we were doing the CTAs every six months. Do you think by doing this an x-ray every six months that you could catch this to see if it's getting larger if it needs to be operated on he said oh yeah I said he said yeah we, we can do it every six months we'll catch it before it, it, it uh, emerges and I said okay so I did that for three years I had a ton of those CTAs so I was scheduled to go in for another CTA and um I told Brother Smith, I said, you know, Brother Smith, I said, every day I wake up and I have something in my head, and for three years I trusted God that he would keep me alive, and, and I went up for prayer many times. I said, God hasn't healed me, but neither has it ruptured. I said, but, so that's the condition I'm in. I'm trusting God. I said, but here lately, Brother Smith, uh, 
I feel like I need to have surgery on there. And I went to him for counsel. This is a big decision. I mean, it's no fun to have, have your head cut open, you know, it's just no fun. And he said, well, has it changed any? I said, no, the last time it hasn't changed size, it hasn't changed shape. He said, well, what's changed? I said, I just feel. For those whole three years while I was trusting God, I wanted to get that operated on so bad because I saw the bad experience I went through before. But I was trusting God. Have you ever been there where you're trusting God, but you know that it, it, it's really hard if it's, if it's life-threatening? Uh, may, maybe you haven't. Maybe one day you will. But I knew that every day that this thing could rupture, but yet I was trusting God, and I would not have it done as a trust issue, but I was also trying to hear the voice of God, the voice of our shepherd. So I told, so Brother Smith and I, we talked for quite a while, and I said, I said, Brother Smith, I said, I, I really feel like I need to get this done. He said, well, uh, okay, well, this, he said, no, I think you should get it done then. So I, so uh, we, went, we went in for uh, the CAT scan, and the, I asked Dr. I said, has it changed any? He says, no. I said, well, I want to schedule uh, an appointment to have this fixed. He said, okay. So they arranged it. I went in. I got there at 6 in the morning. It's, a, it's about a, it's not a long surgery. It's only about a three-hour surgery. But he told my wife later, he told me, he says, I'm really glad your husband came in for this surgery. He said, it's true. Little nubbin had not changed its size or its shape. But what they do is they remove part of your skull and then they go in and they slowly spread your brain to where the artery is. They said, when I, he said, when I got down to where that artery was, every time your husband's heart would beat, uh, and it, this, it wouldn't show up on a CTA scan, every time your husband's heart would beat, that aneurysm would pulse. He said, they're not supposed to do that. He said, that, that means it's ready to, ready to rupture. And I felt like that was God. And when, when I came out of surgery, I told God, I said, thank you. I said for, number one, for allowing me to uh, uh, exercise my faith uh, in you for three years and helping me, but also by helping me to hear your voice, helping, helping me to hear your voice and what my decision on a major event like that should be. So I feel like God really helped me and I think it's not me but we're all going to the place that we're learning to hear the voice of our shepherd and that is going to lead us into everlasting life and that's why I've been a big believer in uh, God's ministry following God's ministry I will never take my eyes off God's ministry I've been tried on that before uh, but I've been tried enough to know that I've come too far to take my eyes off there because I have my eyes fixed on the goal, which is eternal life. And I know that through the voice of God, which I've been showing you some of these things, how God, uh, we can hear the voice of God. If we just keep listening to his voice, we're going to make it in the very end. So I think it's time for... Uh, band practice, I know we got started early and there's some more things I'd like to say, but I think you all are an intelligent, uh, well-learned group and uh, I probably don't need to uh, go over these points anymore. So thank you for listening to me. See you all upstairs. God bless.